y'all, y'all, y'all ready for this? Hey, what's going on, everybody? It is another episode of the pregame show Rewind. I'm Tali Carr in Atlanta. I hope you guys have had a great weekend. It was a long college football weekend in one. If Colorado is of your rooting interest that you probably will not forget for a long time. So let's discuss it. Everything that we missed, let's relive it. Let's rewind it back. And coming to you this afternoon, this morning, this evening, whenever you're watching, not from Boulder, but back home in Jackson, Mississippi, for the first time in a long time, that there wasn't a padlock on your door when you got back, Neely? No, they don't do that unless you're not paying your bills. And Neely pays his bills. <laughs> Man, did it, did it still smell like home? I mean, what, what, what is it like to be gone for months and, and to finally make it back home, sweet home? Hey, man, it's good to be back at home, sweet home. Just missed Jack State's homecoming. Uh, got here when it was ending, did not get to participate in any with my flights and all that kind of thing. But, hey, man, no place like home and no event like a bye week. Colorado is off this week, so I took that opportunity. Hey, man, let me go back to Mississippi and see the fam. Man, well, it, it was uh, quite the weekend, Neely. Uh, your Jackson State Tigers lost. That was a heartbreaker. And, of course, for those of us who stayed up late enough uh, to see Colorado on Friday night, it was, look, if you watch Colorado, something exciting, historic, <laughs> like there's there's no average Colorado game, man. Uh, but sometimes it's going to be for the greater, sometimes not so much. Um, so let's let's rewind, Neely, because that's what we do here. What what was the scene? Uh, what was the feeling like for that that time of kickoff that it was a Friday night uh, it's on ESPN taking on Stanford. It was 10, 10, 10 20 kickoff on the East coast. So that would have been eight 20 uh, there local Boulder. What, what did that feel like? You guys have played all over the, the, the calendar and the clock. What did Friday night feel like starting? Felt like another game day when you got there uh, leading up to the game, you know, it was interesting having to move the camera around, uh, not the camera, move the calendar around to adjust for a Friday night game. Uh, you know, it's a major difference just that 24 hours makes uh, in logistics and practice and preparation, you know, for a game. Good news, though, it was at home, so we didn't have to burn another additional day traveling. But once game day got there, you know, we played in that time slot before. Uh, the Colorado State game was nationally televised, another 8 p.m., 8.30 kick off, which went into double overtime as well. So maybe there's something about these 8 p.m. kickoffs at home. Uh, but nevertheless, by the time you got to game day, game day preparations, man, it felt like an exciting day to be at home. Tash, tele, national televised game on a Friday night. So if you're watching college football, there was only one to watch, and that was Colorado. All right, so uh, rewind it back. I asked you, did you anticipate a fast start? And you you gave the traditional Neely answer, which is past results usually predict what will happen in the future. But surprise, 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 Neely. <laughs> We're sitting at 29-0. I'm looking at the offensive line. Me and my son are, are sitting there. He, he's three years old. We're you know around the TV watching. The offensive line is just pushing Stanford all over the court. Shador all over the field. Shador has all day to pass. He looked like he was getting taller every drive. He started that game 6-2. He looked like he was 6-10, uh, standing so tall in the pocket by the time halftime got there. Uh, walk us through why you think this game, uh, we finally saw the fast start we had been waiting for. Because it was been preached into him all week. Uh, you know, I interviewed Coach Bryan at the half. First thing I said to him was, man, you 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 called for a fast start and a dominating start. You got exactly what you asked for. Uh, but in true Coach Ryan fashion, he wasn't happy because when you got to the back half of the second quarter, there was a lot of penalties that he raced uh, to score potentially being higher, not knowing at that time that that would have also made the difference in the game. Uh, but I think Shadour uh, was comfortable. You know, the offensive line was protected in those first two quarters uh, for only the second time this season. You know, scored on the opening possession, so made it seven zero. Last time that happened was week one, week zero, if you will, uh, at TCU. Uh, another interesting thing has happened, Tyler. You know, which led to that Colorado to now, even counting both overtime games, has yet to lose a coin toss. Hmm. They, it, it, do they go tails every time? Do they go heads? Do they mix it up? What is there? Is there? It, a little... man, it's, it's it's mixed up because keep in mind. 
sometimes the, the not sometimes the visiting team gets to pick. So it's not like it's your doer's call every game, but the outcome has been the same. It's been our choice, you know, to defer or receive every game. Uh, and the same thing, you know, putting your defense out there so your offense can have the ball coming into the third quarter. Everything went, I'm not going to say perfect the first two quarters because you did have some glaring penalties that just can't take place at this level of, level of ball. But scoring-wise, man, you know, it's hard to ask for more than 29-0 to zero going into halftime. Well, a little later this week, we're going to debut uh, this week's episode of The Big Boys, where we take a, a deeper kind of analytical X and O's look into this past game. So I don't want to get too far in it, but I, I do want to keep keep it at a 5,000, you know, kind of foot level and, and not get too granular. Um, I still have not seen the second half, nearly. So on, on the East Coast, you know, I'm up at 5 a.m. I, I got three young kids. I'm making pancakes, trying to work out and do all that. So Friday's soup, by the time 10, 20 rolled around, <laughs> I was barely hanging on. But I, but I held off for the first half, nearly. Uh, I, 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 you know how you don't realize you fall asleep. You just realize you just woke up. And yeah. and I look up and, and the announcer saying, and, and here comes Stanford is 29-19 and Folsom has gone quiet. And I'm trying to keep my eyes open. Oh, what happened? And the next thing I know, I'm dipping off. But I woke up about 2.30, Sports Center was on. I said, well, Stanford probably made it close. I said, I bet you it was a three-point game and Colorado won. Never in a million years would you have convinced me at 2.30 in the morning that they had lost that game. And right before I pulled the covers back and got into the bed, I said, oh, let me check my phone and see what the final was. And and I feel like I've been dumbfounded ever since that moment. So from from someone who did not emotionally live it, and I'm sure there's people out there watching right now who, who probably fell asleep as well. Um, at what point, Neely, did you say to yourself, if at all, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> What's going on here? Well, it depends on how you dissect it. I probably said, wait a minute after their second score uh, in the half, in the, in the in the back half of the game. Uh, but once again, man, never thought uh, that Colorado, that we would lose that game because we have a guy named Shador Sanders. Uh, and sure enough, uh, you know, it goes into overtime, you know, because of Shador Sanders. So, and even when it goes into overtime, you're not thinking you're going to lose the game because you got a guy named Shador Sanders, who you've seen do this time and time again. Uh, but I, I felt what was interesting is in this, Interesting to hear you bring it up because naturally I'm not listening to the national broadcast. But when they say Folsom went quiet, you know, this is my first year, you know, dealing in Colorado football and home games at Folsom. And it is always prompt, always electric. But there was a moment in that late four quarters, like you could hear a pin drop in there, man. It got it got silent, which was eerie. And I was like, man, you know, uh, maybe these guys going to tie this game up, man. Might be looking at overtime here. Man, so so in, in true Neely fashion, in, until the very until the very end, you thought that that they were going that Colorado was going to hold on for the win. No doubt about it. Even when they even when they kicked the field goal to win in overtime, the kicker had missed one early in the game. So I'm not even thinking then. Like I'm like, all right, well, they're about to blow this kick. Shadur's going to go back out. He's going to score. We're going to shut them out. We're going to go home in triple overtime. Mm, and it does not turn out that way. Stanford At comes all. away with the three-point win. Let's hear now from Shador Sanders. Let's also hear from his dad, Deion Sanders, and what they had to say after this tough loss. I mean, we got to accept this one first, and it's just like it's just a different level of, I would say, focus, different level of attitude, different level of just seriousness because the little things even – like when we scored touchdowns, we still busting routes. Like we just can't afford to do that because it's gonna catch up when it catch up. So that's the main thing. Like understand when when, when God's busting routes and when I'm not getting making the right read, getting the ball in my hand, uh, doing the right thing, then it gotta be some some punishment for it. We gotta be able to grow from it and not keep making the same mistakes. What I just said in the locker room to the team is they got to make up in their mind, are they in love with this game or are they in like with it? Because when you love something, you give to it unconditionally. You give everything you got to it, but when you like it, that's just the button you push. And it lights up in a like. That's what they do on social media. So we got to figure out, do they love it or do they like it? And it's hard for me because I, I, I love this. I, I, I love it. I, I'm, without a shadow of a doubt, I am truly 
100% in love with this thing. And I just want people to match me. Just match my passion. Match my match my heart. Match my love. Match my consistency. Just match my mannerisms. Just match every darn thing I give to this game. I love this. I, sadly, I love it so much, but the game don't even occupy the ability to love you back. That's a strange love, isn't it? So, Neely, you hear it there. Uh, Shador, you know, basically says they got to own it. Uh, Deion Sanders, as any good head coach would do, you know, puts the blame, puts it back on him. You know, people are, are starting to ask about, well, why is this coordinator doing this and why is that coach doing this or that? Uh, but he did question, like, do all of my players really love this game like I expect them to? Um, how would you describe that that locker room uh, after you know his post game speech and, and talking and just everything soaking in? How, how would you put that into words, Neil? Real. Uh, there was no yelling. Uh, there was no you know out of character experiences from the coach you know or the players. Uh, it was a just a good talking to. And when I say talking to, I don't mean like a tongue lashing, you know, yelling, being disrespectful, pointing fingers or blaming. He literally stood on the stage and just had a conversation with them in the same tone that you and I are talking right now. You know, Albert Einstein once said, man, that you never judge a fish by his ability to climb a tree. Now, one of the things that you can take from that, why would you yell at a fish? Why would you cuss at a fish for his inability to climb a tree? So I think Coach Prime has reached a point uh, where he solidified in that I know what I have here and I know I don't have what it takes to be in that constant week to week conversation of the top six to eight teams in the country. And so there's no point in getting my blood pressure up. There's no point in yelling. He doesn't cuss, but no point in doing all those things. What I got to do is get these guys to go from liking it to loving it and then get guys in here who love it because he's always said, man, I'm seven to eight players away from really competing and turning this thing around. And I think when you saw that game, that 29-0 to zero become a three-point overtime loss, double overtime loss, I think it was just the period on the sentence in his mind of like, yep, it's like it's what I thought it was. It is what it is. I don't have what I need yet. You could, but you could, you could see the, you could, you could see the strain on his face. You could, you could hear the how carefully he measured his words uh there in the post game press conference um does it how much does does that speak to his patience you know here's a guy who who knows what it takes to win championships uh wants to win championship he's not, he's not one of these guys like oh let me slowly build a program like he wants to do things right away um if you've ever spent a moment around uh coach prime you will realize he does not waste time and does not appreciate people who even remotely try to waste his time. Um, how do you think it, it weighs on him knowing that, all right, it ain't going to be this year exactly how I want it to be? Well, it's, it's two regards, two, two lanes, if you will. Deion Sanders will tell you, Coach Prime will tell you, that he is impatient when it comes to things that people should be or could be doing differently and just refuse to do it differently. He's real short on his patience with foolishness, with a lack of effort and those kind of things. However, when it comes to teaching and building something and knowing that it takes a change, it's change is going to take time. He's very patient in that regard. Uh, so I think it's mixed emotions and you see him pausing at times because on one hand, he may be thinking about a play, a player or even a coach that could do better. So he's impatient with that, but also realizing that, hey, man, when I get to my second and third string, I get to my special team. I really can't expect me out of those guys. I, so I have to be more patient with that aspect of it. And that's where you get him having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with God in his head where he said, he'll even say in the press conference, say, thank you, Lord, because I was about to say something. <laughs> uh, so he, he he measures his words because he means what he says and he says what he means. But he also looks around that room and knows, I don't have all the tools in the toolbox right now, which leads him to say things like he said just at Jackson State during that COVID year. You better give me now because you won't get me later when I get all the tools that I need in this toolbox. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I've kind of looked at it, and, you know, it's it's weird because at Colorado, he, he does have his quarterback, and he does have some skilled players he did not have that first year. 
um, at Jackson State during that that spring season. So I, I, I kind of look at that needle. I'm like, yeah, this is almost like the spring season. No, nah, this is more like the first year. No, nah. I feel like we're kind of in that in that position of going back and forth when when you when you look for a comp. Um, but Neely, he, here's one thing that doesn't get discussed a lot uh, when people are uh, dissecting, uh, when they're analyzing, critiquing Coach Prime, is there are so few great, great, outstanding players who go on to be great coaches because normally they don't have to – they need people to go do it exactly how they did it, and they don't understand why that's not a normal thing. And you often talk about there's, there's one, there's one, one college coach who has <laughs> the okay. gold jacket. Uh, and I think, I think that's an outstanding thing that uh, a lot of people just take for credit – or take for granted and he doesn't get the full credit for to be that great as a player and you know to have been impacting college football or football in general since 1985 um to still have that patience to to look <laughs> our buddy shannon sharp he, <laughs> he might have had a whole different reaction and i and i pick on shannon because he says you know on record look i don't have the patience man if we practice something and i tell you to do something and then you go do the other thing i ain't got time for it uh but we, we, but we don't give coach prime that credit always it's a lot of years we all give coach prime uh credit for man and and, and too much criticism to the opposite of that of that spectrum as well you know, you have to also keep things in perspective, Tommy. Uh, Las Vegas ain't no food. Las Vegas has built a, a mecca in the desert off of taking folks' money. They know what they're doing. Las Vegas didn't have us winning uh, more than three games. Some didn't have us winning more than two games. Here's a head coach who's taken over a program that was 1-11 and 11 12 months ago, and he now has four wins in that program bringing in an entire new team, entire new staff, people that have to learn their way around, have to know where to eat and shop at, find places to live, everything just in turmoil. And in less than nine months, he's got four wins in that team, something that they couldn't do uh, with everything in their favor in the past. So we got to keep things in perspective that the arrow is indeed pointing up. Uh, he's going to do just like he did at Jackson State and have a world record-breaking uh, transfer class through the portal, through high school and JUCO recruits. It's going to happen. And when that product gets out there, you're not going to see 29 to zero halftime leads evaporate into a double overtime loss. Uh, Deion Sanders knows what he's doing. And think about what you just said, Tali. Here's a man who since 1985 has been the face, the forefront, the spear tip, whether it was in college, the NFL, broadcasting career, now coaching. He's been the top of the conversation since 1985. I was in junior high in 1985. And this man has been the, cut, the leader in football. When I first met Troy Aikman, the first person we ever interviewed on the pregame show, Troy Aikman said, he said, the thing about it, we all play with, with, with Dion, won some Super Bowls with him. We can walk into malls or anywhere else and nobody knows who we are. He is still at the forefront of everybody's mind years later after playing. That's what he brings to the table. And with that comes criticism because with that comes people start to believe in him. So when he started telling you, we're going to turn this thing around now, we're not waiting, and you go one win two wins, three wins. Then you get that loss and everybody's like, oh man, but you said, well, you weren't even thinking it was even possible as Steve told you it was. So it goes both ways, Tali. People believe in them and they support them. And then there are naysayers who sit on the side and just watch for that first chink in the armor to say, ha ha, I told you so. I mean, look, n no one is going to give credit for a woulda, shoulda, coulda. But if you, you look at a team that was 1-11 last year, Neely, you could probably take four plays this season and make them go the other way, and this could very easily be a 6-1 team. Like Absolutely. There's no doubt you could. You could, you could take uh, maybe, as you're saying, like one play a game or three plays a game. Uh, probably the only team, I don't care if Travis was out there or what you did schematically, Oregon was going to win that game. It just would have been in a closer fashion because they are what we're trying to achieve. They have a program. They don't, don't have a team. They have a culture that's no matter who's there, that they affiliate them things, their, their sales with things related to winning, which is what Coach Prime is trying to build in Boulder. So you take away that Oregon loss, you know, USC, man, two plays away, and you upset them just like they got upset this past weekend with, with Notre Dame. Uh, you know, so the glass is half full. The glass ain't half empty, it's half full. And we got a strong table and a nice-looking glass, 
and some clean water in it. And it's going to be more coming in. Hey, and there's uh, no shortage of celebrities coming in. This week, you had a chance to catch up with Anthony Anderson, uh, who I didn't realize how far Anthony Anderson went back. We, we were talking to Reggie Theus. The, you know, Reggie Theus played in the NBA. He's now the athletic director, basketball coach at Bethune-Cookman. He had the, the show Hang Time. A young Anthony Anderson was in that show. I was like, dang, I forgot about that. Uh, you had Cedric the Entertainer. Uh, who his last sitcom man was really, really underrated on CBS. That that thing was funny. Uh, I, I binged that on Prime. But you got Cedric the Entertainer, Anthony Anderson. They did not need my introduction. You had a chance to talk to both of those guys. Cedric the Entertainer, five new pie. Man, what's up, Diggs? What's up, yo? We out here, man. We down. We down here, man. We on the field. It's great. Turn up, man. Rocking. Just sat in there with the coach. I gave him a whole gameplay for the day. I gave him stuff that out from when I played Madden. And I told him, use all my moves. So that, that means we're going to win. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah. Easy call, man. No, nah, that's good. And we go way back, me and Dion, so it's a legendary thing yeah. to come down here and be a part of the culture, man. It's lit. There's been a lot of people to pull up, man. I know you're happy to have you here. Yeah, man. You know, definitely. So we go back to when he was the hot young star. You know what I'm saying? Of course, now you know he's doing it on the coaching side. But, you know, we, we, we back in the day. So, you know, all our fame was related. So it's, uh, it's fun to be a part here and see that the team doing well. City popping off. We in the Colorado is lit, man. So one question though, why, why Anthony Anderson hiding over there? Because you know he, he think he, he think his beard is a disguise. Look at him. Hey, why you why you hide, man? Uh, I ain't what, hiding what? him. I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> now I, th I think the beard is a giveaway. He need to shave the that's, beard if he want to hide. That's what we try to tell him. He walked down the street. Everybody looked at him like they knew that beard. I told him don't cut it off, man. We are trying to sell barbecue sauce. All right, now now, now he. Hide. I went. I wouldn't hide, man. Well, I'm in the witness protection program, man. <laughs> you know, I'm in. I'm in Boulder. I, I, I don't. I don't know what follows me to Boulder. So now we got to finish it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? We're, we're making history. We're making history, and I'm a part of being the history making here. Uh, so I'm excited, man. Yeah. yeah. Look like you can suit up, man. You know, I asked Coach if he needed me to suit up today, and he was like, "You know what? Ed? I'll let you know at halftime." But you good for right now? I was like, "Okay, Coach. I'm gonna be stretching. I'm gonna be stretching." You know, one of your messages is been the importance of diabetes in our community. Coach Prime's daughter plays on the team here. She's managing it well. What's your message in that regard? Uh, my message is to take care of yourself, man. Go to the doctor, get checked up, do what you're supposed to do. Everything is okay in moderation, but we got to make those steps and be disciplined in what we do. We want black folks to live. Oh, yes, sir. We want black folks to live. We want everybody to live, but in particular, black folks, especially with diabetes. Yes, sir. All right. Let me know. All right, Neely, so, so what is it like meeting comedians, man? Everybody expects them to just be funny with, with, with everything they do, even when they're just chilling or, or watching football. What, what, what is the difference, man? You know, you, you've met music stars, athletes, comedians. H how do comedians rank uh, catching up with them on the sidelines? They, they all rank at the top because they all have an affinity for Coach Prime, and they all talk about the relationship they have with them whether it's a long-standing relationship like said the entertainer has with Deion Sanders or, you know, some of the uh, younger people who just grew up, you know, idolizing him and are just getting the first chance to meet him and, and love his message. But the common thread is their support of what's taking place in Boulder, Colorado, and what they see Coach Prime doing to, to young men and to professionals across the board, particularly given so many uh, African-American coaches opportunities uh, because that's one thing that's not discussed in this environment is how many people work for Coach Prime and look like Coach Prime that were given opportunities that that they deserved in the past but did not get for whatever reasons, and we know the reason. So, you know, Cedric Entertainment was happy to be there. And, and you know, Cedric is kind of in that space like a Deion Sanders. that He's been at the top of his crowd, you know, so long that it doesn't matter if there's no ki new kings to come there every summer or, you know, or he doesn't have a sitcom on right now. People know when they see Cedric and Tank, like, hey, man, that, that dude has been doing this for a minute at a high level. And, of course, with Anthony Anderson, you know, he's always, you know, funny and, and, and professional, but also pushes matters of health. So the conversation I had with him about, you know, his personal messaging out there about diabetes, particularly in the black community, you know, you always want to make sure that you're changing some kind of information out there on a positive note and everything is not just ha -ha, laughing and playing, even though you're talking to a comedian. Yeah, yeah. Hey, dog. My name Luscious. They call me Luscious. 
I ain't calling you luscious. <laughs> 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 that Kings of Comedy tour was so good, man. That was that was just like the peak of of in my life uh, of stand up comedy. God, that was you so know good. What, one of my favorite sad stories is Bob Initials. Do you remember that one? <laughs> it was what Bob, Bob Initials. No, how, when you say it, so he, I'll probably remember. But go he, ahead. He's with his cousin, meets his cousin's homeboys, and his homeboy says, "Hey, man, you know, just call me Bob Initials." So he's like, "Man, I'm calling this dude Bob Initials the whole weekend." <laughs> He about to go to the store like, hey, man, Bob Initials, you know, bring this back. And everybody's like, man, what you call him? I call him Bob Initials. That's what he said, call him. He said, man, he was telling you to call him by his initials. Call me by my initials. <laughs> he said, man, but the joke was so country talking so fast. I, he said, call me Bob Initials. <laughs> Let me tell you, man, <clears throat> I am from eastern North Carolina, and sometimes <laughs> my wife will meet my relatives. <laughs> <laughs> And she has no idea what they're saying. And I'm like, yeah, I got it. I, I got it. You you yeah. just have to have been around it and just. Yeah, so tell her, call him CJ, not Bob Punitions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so good. That is so good. Um, our conversations go everywhere, man. I was I was looking through the uh, box score and I saw a breaking news alert. Uh, Suzanne Summers died. From from Three's oh, company. Man. Oh man, yeah. Where where does where where does Chrissy rank on on your on your you know on your list of a little boy in front of TV and and Chrissy comes on and you're like oh look at Chrissy. Yeah, you know it's one of those things where you didn't know what hot was, but you knew it when you saw it. <laughs> yeah. And so it was like uh, when Linda Carter would do her spin and uh-huh. turn into Wonder Woman. He's like, man, I don't know why I like this. I like this. <laughs> and so Free's company, man, historic show. Uh, you know, she was really able to play up that whole dumb blonde character without being dumb in, in real life. Uh man, that's that's we're getting old, Tom. I know. She was 76. 76. And and the and the reason why I saw that, I wasn't looking at the box score. We were looking at the Saturday Night Live. Well, right before we went on, we we both wanted to make mm-hmm. sure, and I, and that came across. Uh, so look, Colorado is everywhere. And, and you said at the beginning of the year, and I got another story about how Colorado is everywhere. You said, Tali, if they win or lose this year is really not going to matter. This thing is going to be the most popular thing that's out there. Uh, and you know, they, they lose the, the Stanford on Friday night. And then Saturday night, there, there is a skit on the, on the weekend update on Saturday night live. One of, you know, their most popular and, and long running skits, uh, Neely, it, it, you know, you might think the common person might think, oh, the air is coming out of the tires. It's not affecting uh, the exposure and the popularity. I mean, everybody wants to win when you want your team to win. But this thing is still rolling strong, man. Now, I don't mean this about the Saturday Night Night Live skit, per se, because that's what they do. You know, it, it, it's Saturday Night Live. But when you look at this thing, 30,000 foot view again. Laughing about a coach losing a game when a program was once one eleven would be like laughing at Moses because your feet got muddy crossing the river. <laughs> like you are overlooking the miracle, you know, to find something wrong in the miracle so you can say, Oh, I told you, I told you he wasn't worth nothing. You know, like the man has parted the Red Sea. And your sandals got muddy, and you get to the other side, and you want to joke and complain. So what he is accomplishing here, uh, people are going to watch it because they love it. People are going to watch it because they hate it. But at the end of the day, it's going to be watched. So you look at that Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Live school. Much like the Jackson State days, here you have a person sitting on national TV in a Colorado shirt and a Colorado hat with Colorado glasses that, that's being sold. How can that be a bad thing? Not at all. Not at all, and and I was hitting my organ for you. Let, let me go full screen with it. That I saw it. It it, it kind of looked more like the dance from Thriller, the way I did it. But that that was my organ. <laughs> I was hitting for you. So speaking of organs, uh, so Neely, I go to church uh, on Sunday morning. Now it's been you know a few Sundays. I, I had the special knock. I had, I had to do the password the whole night. So 
the uh, I'm, I'm taking my kids to check them in at the the children's church, right? So the so the greeter's like, "Hey, man, I've seen you somewhere." <clears throat> and Neely, you 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 can experience this when, when you do content, and you know it's available all across the world. Every once in a while, you run into somebody that is just seeing you, but they don't put two and two together because they're seeing you out of context of where they normally see you, which is on their phone or their computer. And I always have the same answer. I'm like, I don't know, like. Because I don't want to be that guy like, oh, yes, I'm, you know, the host of blah, blah, blah. I just think that's just not me. <laughs> and so he was kind of putting it together. He was like, YouTube? I was like, yeah. And so I'm thinking he's going to say HBCU game day. It's a brother. No <laughs> it's a brother sitting at the church. And I figured, you know, he went to FAMU or something. He says, yeah, that's right. I see you with that Colorado stuff. <laughs> I just thought. Oh my God! It's taking over the church, Neely. It's it's, it's out of control. <laughs> the pregame yes. show is out of control. As Coach Prime would have me do uh, at Jackson State in Colorado, drop that organ right there. That was a good play. <laughs> but I, I don't want the viewers to lose a message in what Tali Carter said. This is not about a brother at a church in Metro Atlanta recognizing Tali Carr from the pregame show YouTube channel. This is more about Tali Carr. Holly Carr needing a babysitter, so he takes his kids to children's <laughs> church. Just go sit in the car and watch the NFL on his phone. Like that's what really happened. This wasn't about time and other message. He said, "Man, oh, they got children's church. Let me let me, let me get some free time." <laughs> Neely, I seriously consider going back to the car. <laughs> I told y'all. So y'all think I just making jokes? Look, look at his reaction. I told y'all. <laughs> the only, <laughs> the only thing that scared me was <laughs> if my son would have gotten in trouble because they <laughs> they got this thing in the church, man, where it's like the big screen. And they, they do a little scroll across the bottom. If you got to come get your kids, they, yeah. they put their name at the bottom. Well, the parents of Noah Carr come. I said, if I, <laughs> this is so bad. <laughs> if I go back to the car and his name is scrolling and I don't go get him and they call his mama who wasn't with yeah. us, <laughs> I would have been in so much trouble. <laughs> you did right. Because you know, genetically, <laughs> He is getting to trouble. Ooh. His last name is Carr, so you can't leave him unsupervised too long at Children's I Church. I thought about right it, now. man. I seriously thought about it. I was like, I could sit in the car for about two hours. I could do some work and go back yeah. and get him. But I went inside. I went fully inside, and I kept the uh, I kept the program as as a receipt. <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah, I did. I was there. Oh my God! They're either laughing or tearing me up in the comments right now. This is, um, <laughs> but this is what happens, man. I hang out with Neely. He knows me. He knows. I do know you, and I know, I know him. him, and I know him. Too. I'd be like, man, look, let's go sit in the car. They watch the views. The difference between me and you, you would have driven around the corner and probably smoked a cigar. I at least would have stayed on on premise. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Three babies. I, I would have bumped up the donation, man, just out of not out of guilt, just out of hey, man, expand children's shirt. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Truth to make you laugh or make you cry. Ooh, I, I I'm just so happy, man, that we we have a community of people that can just ride with us, and we can just like keep it absolutely 100 man like hey man you know you you never know what's gonna come up like so this is this this what happens oh boy you told on me right there because i sure <laughs> not thought about it <laughs> <laughs> all right man it's an off week it's an off week uh what, what are you gonna are you gonna chill a little bit i am i am gonna chill man uh now i'm gonna still be dropping content uh we did a, a series of interviews with coaches and players uh, that are kind of what you call in this space undated. Uh, so we're going to be dropping some content during this bye week, never seen before stuff. Uh, so there's no reason to think that, hey, man, it's a bye week. Let me not watch the pregame show. And it's the same thing for the offseason. You know, we always have content 
uh, that has never been published to keep people's appetite going. Uh, but, you know, one thing about Coach Brian Deion Sanders, man, such a blessed person uh, to be able to have his mother there in Colorado with him uh, and to have his kids there in Colorado with him, uh, except for one. Uh, well, you know, Neely's not in that world yet. So when I want to see mom, I got to come back to Mississippi and I want to uh, see kids or even my grandson. Tell him I'm going to shoot you a video now of me and my grandson. Uh, you got to come home sometime, man. So the bye week fell at a perfect time. It was really at that midpoint of the season. So when we get back, you know, the first thing is a road game. We go to UCLA and then back-to-back -back games at home and then the final two games on the road. So, Neely, you and I were super confident about being one game away from bowl eligibility. Uh, we had kind of penciled in a win against Stanford to, to put yes. Colorado right there at, at five and two. Now four and three, and, and the one thing that you said, hey, look, it's tougher later. <laughs> there's some, yeah, there's absolutely, some, there's absolutely. some, there's some numbers to the left of those teams' names, meaning they are ranked. Um, are you still, are you still bullish on, on a at least a six-win team uh, that can go bowling at the end of the season? There, there's no doubt about it, man. Look, let me tell you this: you threw out the number 1985 as it relates to Dion Prime Time, Neon Dion, Coach Prime, whatever you want to call him, Sanders. If you realize since 1985, if you bet on him every time, no matter what happens, you would win about 85% of the times you bet on. Like, why would I in this situation go like, ah, no, no, I'm bearish. I don't, let me cash out my chips. I'm not right. No, I'm, I'm, I'm in, man. I believe these guys can do it. Uh, I stood on this instead, said this on the sports show I do with the uh, DMVR Sports uh, Buzz Live in, in Colorado that going into this game, the Stanford game, was a quote-unquote must-win situation. Not that the season would be over if, it, if we didn't win it. It's because the schedule gets harder when it gets to November. Uh, but you never know who you're facing. When you look at the Pac-12, what happened this past weekend after Colorado's Friday night loss, you know, there was upheaval, man. USC lost to, uh, to Notre Dame. So there's going to be a degree of cannibalization, you know, within the conference that when these undefeated and one loss Pac-12 teams start playing each other, somebody's going to lose. Uh, you know, then you have things like injury to come up, God forbid. So I'm still confident this team can reach bowl status with six wins. It would have been advantageous to beat Stanford. You know, again, Tali, something people who watch this program, you know, since been with us since day one have heard me say. It's on your road to a championship or on your road to a bowl game, a couple of things have to happen. You have to beat everybody you're supposed to beat. And then you've got to beat somebody that you weren't supposed to beat. We just lost to a team that we were supposed to beat. All it does to the math is now we got to beat two people we ain't supposed to beat. It can happen. And I, I think the way the Pac-12 has gone, and I'm not a Pac-12 historian, I am new to the party. Uh, but just this past weekend, you can almost say there's one team everybody's going to beat in the Pac-12 that they shouldn't beat. I mean, this weekend was, you know, you had Washington State and – in their game, uh, you know, Notre Dame was pretty tough for USC. But, you know, this is one of those conference, man. Th these teams have, have played each other for so long. They're so familiar with one another that um, yeah. you, you could almost pencil in on each schedule, probably both ways, you know, beating somebody you shouldn't beat and, and losing to somebody that, that you sure. shouldn't lose. Sure. To. Absolutely. Those final two games on the road, you got to go uh, to Pullman, Washington, Washington State on a Friday night. You know it's going to be cold. You know it's going to be rainy. Uh, then you travel to Utah uh, uh, Thanksgiving weekend, if you will, for the final game of the season. So backing up, if you will, ahead of those two, you've really got three games left that you need to get these two wins out of so that you're not stressing yourself on the road to final two. You got to go to UCLA. You got to play your best ball, get out of the win. And then you have uh, Arizona State and Oregon State. I said the order wrong, uh, but Arizona State and Oregon State comes home for two games back to back at Folsom Field. Got to get one of those. That puts you at six. That puts you at a bowl game. You know, Coach Prime coaches to win, believes he's going to win every game. But it certainly takes the quote-unquote pressure of being on the road to final two games and looking for that sixth win of el bowl eligibility when you can go ahead and take care of it at home. So, Neely, uh, after a loss like this and then having the bye week uh, immediately following that, do you think emotionally th this is, for the most part, for this team, do you think this is something that's going to just piss them off and, and and just make them focus that much more? Or does this have the potential to, you know, kind of mess with your psyche a little bit? 
I'm going to go to piss off route and piss off in a direction of accountability, accountability, fortitude, digging in, digging deeper, proving that you're one of the guys that love it and not just like it. Uh, as Coach Pryor closed his remarks to the team uh, Friday night, his final words were, oh, yeah, we practicing tomorrow. You know, so the five-week schedule had some changes to it because of not only losing that game, but the manner in which you lost it. We got to go back to the uh, go back to the to the to the grill stone, the grindstone, if you will, or even go to the woodshed one because they just took us to the woodshed. So I think you're going to see some some positive difference to come from that loss. Here's another thing I think is going to come from this loss, uh, Tali. That's a positive. National TV Friday night. College people are watching this game because their games are tomorrow, so they're sequestered in their team hotel all around the country watching this. And it is going to lead to more success in the transfer portal because you're watching a team and you're not necessarily getting your reps at, reps at Alabama or Oregon or, or Auburn or wherever. And you're going like, man, I can make a difference there. I would have been a difference maker there. And so losing and still being national televised as you're trying to build a program is another level and layer of recruiting and marketing. So I think it's going to help because people saw it and people see where they can plug in. And, and just to go back a little bit, uh, that will be – that'll be Arizona, not Arizona yes, State. Yes, Arizona. Right? You played Arizona State. You're exactly right. Arizona comes to Folsom for that uh, home game. You're sure. exactly right. We've so, already been to Arizona State. So no more Arizona heat for, for the rest of this rest of this uh, calendar. No, you know, um, we go to L.A. for UCLA, and it's not going to be Tempe, Arizona temperatures. It'll be SoCal temperatures. Uh, but the rest of the games, be it at home on the road, probably going to be a little chill in there because you got two at Folsom Field, then you go to Washington. I know that's going to be cold. And then you go to Utah, and we know that's going to be cold. Among other things. <laughs> but when you get that six pin, Tali, it's pretty warm inside the Mercedes Benz Dome in Atlanta, Georgia for the Peach Bowl. Just putting it out there. Hey, man, I was I was there last weekend. Uh, felt pretty good. It, it was chilly waiting outside in the shade, but but you got yeah. in there, uh, taking on the Texans, and uh, it 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 felt pretty good in there. Uh, they have they had some great uh, what was this thing called stadium stadium nachos? Like there, there's some good eats in there, man. All they need at Mercedes Benz for your Falcons when you go to those games. Is some form of children's football. <laughs> you, walk off. you get you get you some daddy wrists. You make it just seem like I'm always trying to put my kids off on somebody, Neely. Come on. Yeah. Half so, the know. time, half the time they're running around just outside no, no, the no, shot no. of the camera me, when we're let me doing say these. This so the world doesn't dig too deep into my jokes. Second only to Neely, <laughs> Tyler's the best dad I know. Kids are always with him. Like he has them at work. You know, sometimes we have to edit because he said, hey, man, sit down. <laughs> but I always tease him, too, now. All he makes him is peanut butter and jelly sandwich because that's all he know how to cook. So they have peanut butter and jelly out. Dude, no, 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 no. I can't, I can't let you get away with that. For for lunch today, before I came in here, I, I took these children to church. I stopped at the grocery store. I came home. I made jerk shrimp. I had this orange lemon salmon on a skewer. I made homemade uh, Brussels sprouts and this like uh, coconut ginger rice. And I put on, man. I put on for the city today. So that is almost like a basket on chops, <laughs> but you have to add on. And I topped it off with a peanut butter and jelly demi glaze because you ain't leaving that peanut butter and jelly out. Now I I will hit a PB and J once a day. I, I buy the Uncrustables, so I keep them on deck. Uh, at almost fifty years old, I will still tear up peanut butter and jelly for sure. All right, well uh, I got some more stuff to do, Neely. I got more work to do. Me and you can sit here and talk all day long. I want you to enjoy your time in Jackson. Get out there with that grandson, man, and and start working on his beard. Is is never too yeah, early. It's coming. It's coming along. It, it runs in the family. <laughs> all right. But don't go anywhere because the content does not stop. It is an off week on the field. It is not an off week for the pregame show. Content coming to you. And, folks, you guys need to do your part because I promised. Last time I talked to Neely, I said, Neely, next time we're going to be at 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. And we're probably somewhere, what, neighborhood like 500 or so away. 
Um, so let's do it. I, I know I know there's at least 500 people out there that manually come here to watch content and just for whatever reason did not hit the subscribe button. So take a moment to do that now. Let's get Uncle Neely over 100K so he can get his thing that Google is going to send them and he'll just feel fancy and all good about himself and we can brag on our community next time we talk. Next time, Neely. Next time, I promise. And we'll celebrate with PB and J while the kids are locked down at church. Absolutely. We'll do it right here. <laughs> Uncrustable city. All right. For Uncle Neely, I'm Tali Gar. Thank you so much for hanging out with us here on the pregame show. We'll talk to you next time on The Rewind.